advocates of freed markets should oppose capitalism. Gary Chartier, 2010. 1. Introduction. Defenders of freed markets have good reason to identify their position as a species of anti-capitalism. Footnote. For freed markets, see William Gillis, The Freed Market, Chapter 1, pages 19 to 20 in this volume. For free market anti-capitalism, see Kevin A. Carson, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism. No publisher. Mutualist.blogspot.com. December 31st, 2009. To explain why, I distinguished three potential meanings of capitalism before suggesting that people committed to freed markets should oppose capitalism in my second and third senses. Then, I offer reasons for using capitalism to tag some of the social arrangements to which freed market advocates should object. 2. Three Senses of Capitalism There are at least three distinguishable senses of capitalism. Footnote. Compare Charles Johnson. Anarchistas por la Causa, Radgeek People's Daily, no publisher, March 31st, 2005, radgeek.com, Roderick T. Long, Putmop Redu, Austro-Athenian Empire, no publisher, June 22nd, 2009, aaeblog.com, Fred Foldvery, When Will Michael Moore Nail Land Speculators, The Progress Report, no publisher, October 19th, 2009, Progress.org. Capitalism, in Johnson's third sense, refers to boss-directed labor, while Long's parallel expression, capitalism too, denotes control of the means of production by someone other than the workers, i.e. by capitalist owners. Foldvery's parallel proposal is exploitation of labor by the big owners of capital. I am inclined to think that many of those who employ capitalism, in the pejorative sense, intend it to encompass the dominance by capitalists of all social institutions and not just workplaces, though they doubtless see societal dominance and workplace dominance as connected. At any rate, supposing that they do may provide a slender justification for distinguishing my typology from the ones offered by Johnson, Long, and Foldvery. For an earlier discussion by a libertarian of the inherently ambiguous character of capitalism, see Clarence B. Carson, Capitalism, Yes and No. The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 35.2, February 1985, pages 75 to 82, Foundation for Economic Education, thefreemanonline.org. Thanks to Sheldon Richman for bringing this article to my attention. There are at least three distinguishable senses of capitalism. Capitalism 1 an economic system that features personal property rights and voluntary exchanges of goods and services. Capitalism 2. An economic system that features a symbiotic relationship between big business and government. Capitalism 3. Rule of workplaces, society, and if there is one, the state, by capitalists, that is, by a relatively small number of people who control investable wealth and the means of production. Footnote. While capitalism, too, obtains whenever business and the state are in bed together, under capitalism 3, business is clearly on top. Capitalism 1 just is a free market. So if anti-capitalism meant opposition to capitalism 1, free market anti-capitalism would be oxymoronic. But proponents of free market anti-capitalism aren't opposed to capitalism 1. Instead, they object either to capitalism 2 or to both Capitalism 2 and Capitalism 3. Footnote. It is unclear when capitalism was first employed. The Oxford English Dictionary identifies William Makepeace Thackeray as the earliest user of the term. See The Newcomes, Memoirs of a Most Respectable Family. Two volumes, London, Bradbury, 1854-1855, to 275. By contrast, Capitalist as a pejorative has an older history, appearing at least as early as 1792, and figuring repeatedly in the work of the free market socialist Thomas Hodgkin. See, for example, Popular Political Economy, four lectures delivered at the London Mechanics Institution, London, Tate, 1827, pages 5, 51 2, 120, 121, 126, 138, 171, Greedy Capitalists. 238 to 240, 243, 245 to 249, 253 to 257, 265. 
The natural and artificial right of property contrasted a series of letters addressed without permission to H. Browham Esquire, MPFRS, London, Steele, 1832, pages 15, 44, 53, 54, 67, 87, 97 to 101, 134 to 135, 150, 155, 180. The pejorative use occurs nearly 80 times throughout the 30-odd pages of Hodgkin's labor defined against the claims of capital or the unproductiveness of capital proved. London, Knight, 1825. It is also possible to find capitalist employed in less than flattering ways by another noted classical liberal. See John Taylor, Tyranny Unmasked, Washington, Davis, 1822. Many people seem to employ definitions that combine elements from these distinct senses of capitalism. Both enthusiasts for and critics of capitalism seem too often to mean by the words something like an economic system that features personal property rights and voluntary exchanges of goods and services, and therefore, predictably, also rule by capitalists. But there's good reason to challenge the assumption that dominance by a small number of wealthy people is in any sense a likely feature of a freed market. Such dominance, I suggest, is probable only when force and fraud impede economic freedom. 3. Why Capitalism 2 and Capitalism 3 are inconsistent with freed market principles. A. Introduction. Capitalism 2 and Capitalism 3 are both inconsistent with freed market principles. Capitalism 2 because it involves direct interference with market freedom. Capitalism 3 because it depends on such interference, both past and ongoing, and because it flies in the face of the general commitment to freedom that underlies support for market freedom in particular. B. Capitalism 2 involves direct interference with market freedom. Capitalism 2 is clearly inconsistent with Capitalism 1, and so with the freed market. Under Capitalism 2, politicians interfere with personal property rights and voluntary exchanges of goods and services to enrich themselves and their constituents, and big businesses influence politicians in order to foster interference with personal property rights and voluntary exchanges to enrich themselves and their allies. C. Capitalism 3 depends on past and ongoing interference with market freedom. There are three ways in which Capitalism 3 might be understood to be inconsistent with Capitalism 1 and so with the freed market. The first depends on a plausible, even if contestable, view of the operation of markets. Call this view Markets Undermine Privilege, MUP. According to MUP, in a freed market, absent the kinds of privileges afforded the usually well-connected beneficiaries of state power under capitalism too, wealth would be widely distributed and large hierarchical businesses would prove inefficient and wouldn't survive. Both because most people don't like working in hierarchical work environments and because flatter, more nimble organizations would be much more viable than large clunky ones without government support for big businesses, most people in a freed market would work as independent contractors or in partnerships or cooperatives. There would be far fewer large businesses. Those that still existed likely wouldn't be as large as today's corporate behemoths, and societal wealth would be widely dispersed among a vast number of small firms. Other kinds of privileges for the politically well-connected that tend to make and keep people poor, think occupational licensure and zoning laws, for instance, would be absent from a freed market. Footnote. For a devastating critique of rules, often supported by politicians beholden to wealthy and well-connected people who expect to benefit from them, that systematically make and keep people poor, see Charles Johnson, Scratching By, How Government Creates Poverty as We Know It. The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 5710, December 2007, pages 33-38, to 38, Foundation for Economic Education. TheFreemanOnline.org so ordinary people, even ones at the bottom of the economic ladder, would be more likely to enjoy a level of economic security that would make it possible for them to opt out of employment in unpleasant working environments, including big businesses. 
and because a free society wouldn't feature a government with the supposed right, much less the capacity, to interfere with personal property rights and voluntary exchanges, those who occupy the top of the social ladder in Capitalism III wouldn't be able to manipulate politicians to gain and maintain wealth and power in a freed market, so the ownership of the means of production wouldn't be concentrated in a few hands. In addition to ongoing interference with market freedom, MUP suggests that Capitalism III would not be possible without past acts of injustice on a grand scale. And there is extensive evidence of massive interference with property rights and market freedom, interference that has led to the impoverishment of huge numbers of people in England, the United States, and elsewhere. Footnote. Compare Albert J. Nock, Our Enemy the State, New York, Morrow, 1935. Kevin A. Carson, The Subsidy of History, the Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 58-5, June 2008, pages 33-38, to 38, Foundation for Economic Education, thefreemanonline.org, Joseph R. Stromberg, The American Land Question, The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 59-6, July to August 2009, pages 33-38, to 38, Foundation for Economic Education, thefreemanonline.org. Freed market advocates should thus object to Capitalism III, because capitalists are able to rule only in virtue of large-scale, state-sanctioned violations of legitimate property rights. d. Support for Capitalism III is inconsistent with support for the underlying logic of freedom. Capitalism III might also be understood to be inconsistent with Capitalism I in light of the underlying logic of support for freed markets. No doubt some people favor personal property rights and voluntary exchanges, Capitalism I, for their own sake, without trying to integrate support for Capitalism I into a broader understanding of human life and social interaction. For others, however, support for Capitalism I reflects an underlying principle of respect for personal autonomy and dignity. Those who take this view, advocates of what I'll call comprehensive liberty, CL, want to see people free to develop and flourish as they choose, in accordance with their own preferences, provided they don't aggress against others. Proponents of CL value not just freedom from aggression, but also freedom from the kind of social pressure people can exert because they or others have engaged in or benefited from aggression, as well as freedom from non-aggressive but unreasonable, perhaps petty, arbitrary, social pressure that constrains people's options and their capacities to shape their lives as they like. Valuing different kinds of freedom emphatically isn't the same as approving the same kinds of remedies for assaults on these different kinds of freedom. While most advocates of CL aren't pacifists, they don't want to see arguments settled at gunpoint. They unequivocally oppose aggressive violence, so they don't suppose that petty indignities warrant violent responses. At the same time, though, they recognize that it makes no sense to favor freedom as a general value while treating nonviolent assaults on people's freedom as trivial. Thus, they favor a range of nonviolent responses to such assaults, including public shaming, blacklisting, striking, protesting, withholding voluntary certifications, and boycotting. Footnote. Compare Charles Johnson, Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin, Rad Geek People's Daily, No Publisher, October 3, 2008, radgeek.com. Carrie Howley, We're All Cultural Libertarians, Reason, Reason Foundation, November 2009, reason.com. CL provides, then, a further reason to oppose Capitalism III. Most people committed to CL find MUP very plausible, and thus will be inclined to think of Capitalism III as a product of Capitalism II. But the understanding of freedom as a multidimensional value that can be subject to assaults both violent and nonviolent provides good reason to oppose Capitalism III, even if, as is most unlikely, it were to occur in complete isolation from Capitalism II. E. Conclusion Capitalism II and Capitalism III are both inconsistent with freed market principles. Capitalism II because it involves direct interference with market freedom, Capitalism III because it depends on such interference, both past and ongoing, and because it flies in the face of the general commitment to freedom that underlies support for market freedom in particular. 4. Why freed market advocates should call the system they oppose capitalism. Given the contradictory meanings of capitalism, perhaps sensible people should avoid using it at all. But words are known by the company they keep. Footnote. 
I became acquainted with this phrase thanks to Nicholas Lash, believing three ways in one God, a reading of the Apostles' Creed, Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame Press, 1992. See, for example, page 12. But it appears I have subsequently discovered to have a legal provenance and to be a rough translation of the Latin phrase nositur a socius. So, while they certainly shouldn't use it as a tag for the system they favor, there are good reasons for advocates of freed markets, especially those committed to CL, to use this word for what they oppose. Footnote. To be sure, proponents of freed markets, and so of capitalism one, could obviously refer to capitalism two at least as state capitalism, corporate capitalism, actually existing capitalism, or corporatism but doing so wouldn't make clear their opposition to capitalism three. One, to emphasize the specific undesirability of capitalism three. Labels like state capitalism and corporatism capture what is wrong with capitalism two, but they don't quite get at the problem with capitalism three. Even if, as seems plausible, rule by capitalists requires a political explanation, an explanation in terms of the independent misbehavior of politicians and of the manipulation of politicians by business leaders, it is worth objecting to rule by big business in addition to challenging business-government symbiosis. Footnote. See, for example, Roderick T. Long, Toward a Libertarian Theory of Class, Social Philosophy and Policy, 15-2, Summer 1998. Pages 303 to 349. Tom G. Palmer, Classical Liberalism, Marxism, and the Conflict of Classes, The Classical Liberal Theory of Class Conflict. Realizing Freedom, Libertarian Theory, History, and Practice. Washington, Cato, 2009, pages 255 to 276. Wally Conger, Agorist Class Theory, A Left Libertarian Approach to Class Conflict Analysis. No Publisher, No Date agorism.info. Kevin A. Carson, Another Free for All, Libertarian Class Analysis, Organized Labor, etc. Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, No Publisher, January 26, 2006. Mutualist.blogspot.com. Sheldon Richman, Class Struggle Rightly Conceived, The Goal is Freedom, Foundation for Economic Education, July 13, 2007. FEE.org. Walter E. Grinder and John Hagel. Toward a Theory of State Capitalism, Ultimate Decision Making and Class Structure. Journal of Libertarian Studies, 1 1, 1977, pages 59 to 79. To the extent that those who own and lead big businesses are often labeled as capitalists, identifying what proponents of freedom oppose as capitalism helps appropriately to highlight their critique of Capitalism 3. 2. To differentiate proponents of freed markets from vulgar market enthusiasts. The capitalist banner is often waved enthusiastically by people who seem inclined to confuse support for freed markets with support for Capitalism 2 and Capitalism 3, perhaps ignoring the reality or the problematic nature of both, perhaps even celebrating Capitalism 3 as appropriate in light of the purportedly admirable characters of business titans. Opposing capitalism helps ensure that advocates of freed markets are not confused with these vulgar proponents of freedom for the power elite. 3. To emphasize that the freed market really is an unknown ideal. Similarly, given the frequency with which the contemporary economic order in Western societies is labeled capitalism, anyone who acknowledges the vast gap between ideals of freedom and an economic reality distorted by privilege and misshapen by past acts of violent dispossession will have good reason to oppose what is commonly called capitalism rather than embracing it. 4. To challenge a conception of the market economy that treats capital as more fundamental than labor. Multiple factors of production, notably including labor, contribute to the operation of a market economy. To refer to such an economy as capitalist is to imply incorrectly that capital plays the most central role in a market economy, and that the capitalist, the absentee owner of investable wealth, is ultimately more important than the people who are the sources of labor. Advocates of freed markets should reject this inaccurate view. Footnote. See Kevin A. Carson, Capitalism, A Good Word for a Bad Thing, Center for a Stateless Society, Center for a Stateless Society, March 6, 2010, 
c4ss.org. 5. To Reclaim Socialism for Freed Market Radicals Capitalism and socialism are characteristically seen as forming an oppositional pair, but it was precisely the socialist label that a radical proponent of freed markets, Benjamin Tucker, owned at the time when these terms were being passionately debated and defined. Footnote. See Benjamin R. Tucker, State Socialism and Anarchism, How Far They Agree and Wherein They Differ, Instead of a Book by a Man Too Busy to Write One, New York, Tucker, 1897, fair-use.org, no date. Compare Kevin A. Carson, Socialist Definitional Free for All, Part 2, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, No Publisher, December 8, 2005, mutualist.blogspot.com. Brad Spangler, Restating the Point, Rothbardian Socialism, bradspangler.com, No Publisher, October 10, 2009. Gary Chartier, Socialist Ends, Market Means, Five Essays, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Tulsa Alliance of the Libertarian Left, 2009, Center for a Stateless Society, August 31, 2009, c4ss.org. Tucker clearly saw no conflict between his intense commitment to freed markets and his membership of the First International. That's because he understood socialism as a matter of liberating workers from oppression by aristocrats and business executives, and he, plausibly, believed that ending the privileges conferred on economic elites by the state would be the most effective and safest way of achieving socialism's liberating goal. Opposing capitalism helps to underscore the important place of radicals like Tucker in the contemporary freedom movement's lineage, and to provide today's advocates of freedom with a persuasive rationale for capturing the socialist label from state socialists. This is especially appropriate because advocates of freedom believe that society, connected people cooperating freely and voluntarily rather than the state, should be seen as the source of solutions to human problems. Thus, they can reasonably be said to favor socialism, not as a kind of, but as an alternative to, statism. Footnote. Thanks to Sheldon Richmond for helping me to see this point. Embracing anti-capitalism underscores the fact that freed markets offer a way of achieving socialist goals, fostering the empowerment of workers and the wide dispersion of ownership of and control over the means of production using market means. Footnote. Alex Tabarrok, Rename Capitalism Socialism, Marginal Revolution, No Publisher, January 25, 2010, MarginalRevolution.com, maintains, Capitalism is a truly social system, a system that unites the world in cooperation, peace, and trade. Thus, if all were tabula rasa, socialism might be a good name for capitalism, but that boat has sailed. It seems to me that Tabarrok misses the point of the argument about capitalism, which is precisely whether what is regularly labeled capitalism by the majority of people in the world really is a truly social system that unites the world in cooperation, peace, and trade. 6. To express solidarity with workers. If MUP is correct, the ability of big business, capital, to maximize the satisfaction of its preferences more fully than workers are able to maximize the satisfaction of theirs, is a function of business-state symbiosis that is inconsistent with freed market principles. And, as a matter of support for CL, there is often further reason to side with workers when they are being pushed around, even non-aggressively. To the extent that the bosses workers oppose are often called capitalists, so that anti-capitalism seems like a natural tag for their opposition to these bosses, and to the extent that freed markets, by contrast with Capitalism II and Capitalism III, would dramatically increase the opportunities for workers simultaneously to shape the contours of their own lives and to experience significantly greater prosperity and economic security, Embracing anti-capitalism is a way of clearly signaling solidarity with workers. Footnote. Compare Sheldon Richman, Workers of the World Unite for a Free Market. The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, Foundation for Economic Education, December 18, 2009. TheFreemanOnline.org. 7. To identify with the legitimate concerns of the global anti-capitalist movement. 
Owning anti-capitalism is also a way, more broadly, of identifying with ordinary people around the world who express their opposition to imperialism, the increasing power in their lives of multinational corporations, and their own growing economic vulnerability by naming their enemy as capitalism. Perhaps some of them endorse inaccurate theoretical accounts of their circumstances in accordance with which it really is a freed market system, capitalism one, that should be understood as lying behind what they oppose. But for many of them, objecting to capitalism doesn't really mean opposing freed markets. It means using a convenient label provided by social critics who are prepared, as advocates of freedom too often regrettably are not, to stand with them in challenging the forces that seem bent on misshaping their lives and those of others. Advocates of freedom have a golden opportunity to build common ground with these people, agreeing with them about the wrongness of many of the circumstances they confront, while providing a freedom-based explanation of their circumstances and remedy for the attendant problems. Footnote. Quote, if you were to ask what is anarchism, we would all disagree, said Vlad Blifet, a member of the collective that organized the 2010 Los Angeles Anarchist Book Fair. While most anarchists agree on the basic principle that the world would be better without hierarchy and without capitalism, he said, they have competing theories on how to achieve that change. Kate Linthicum, Book Fair Draws an Array of Anarchists, LATimes.com, Los Angeles Times, January 25th, 2010. Given the focus on opposition to real-world hierarchy, I suspect, without evidence, that Bliffett's primary objection was not to capitalism as a system of ownership and exchange in the abstract, capitalism one, but rather to social dominance by capitalists, capitalism three. The failure to see this point will tend to impede an otherwise natural alliance focused on issues ranging from war to torture to surveillance to drugs to freedom of speech to corporatism to bailouts to decentralization to the reach of the administrative state. 5. Conclusion Thirty-five years ago, Carl Hess wrote, I have lost my faith in capitalism, and I reject this capitalist nation-state, observing that he had turned from the religion of capitalism. Footnote. Carl Hess, Dear America. New York, Morrow, 1975. Pages 3 and 5. Even more bluntly, Hess writes, What I have learned about corporate capitalism, roughly, is that it is an act of theft, by and large, through which a very few live very high off the work, invention, and creativity of very many others. It is the grand larceny of our particular time in history, the grand larceny in which a future of freedom, which could have followed the collapse of feudalism, was stolen from under our noses by a new bunch of bosses doing the same old things. Page 1. Complicating the story is the fact that Hess subsequently wrote Capitalism for Kids, Growing Up to Be Your Own Boss, Wilmington, Delaware, Enterprise, 1987. Distinguishing three senses of capitalism, market order, business government partnership, and rule by capitalists helps to make clear why, like Hess, someone might be consistently committed to freedom while voicing passionate opposition to something called capitalism. It makes sense for freed market advocates to oppose both interference with market freedom by politicians and business leaders and the social dominance, aggressive and otherwise, of business leaders. And it makes sense for them to name what they oppose capitalism. Doing so calls attention to the freedom movement's radical roots, emphasizes the value of understanding society as an alternative to the state, highlights the difference between freed market ideal and present reality, underscores the fact that proponents of freedom object to non-aggressive as well as aggressive restraints on liberty, ensures that advocates of freedom aren't confused with people who use market rhetoric to prop up an unjust status quo, and expresses solidarity between defenders of freed markets and workers, as well as ordinary people around the world who use capitalism as a shorthand label for the world system that constrains their freedom and stunts their lives. Freed market advocates should embrace anti-capitalism in order to encapsulate and highlight their full-blown commitment to freedom and their rejection of alternatives that use talk of liberty to conceal acquiescence in exclusion, subordination, and deprivation. Footnote. Brian Doherty, Ayn Rand, Radical for Something Other Than Capitalism, Hit and Run, Reason Magazine, Reason Foundation, January 20th, 2010, Reason.com, reports, 
I have been happy using capitalism in Rand's ideal sense as that which American libertarians advocate, which I think is true and I don't think represents such a severe intellectual, marketing, or historical problem as Long says. Doherty opines that Long is far too blithe in his conclusion that the fact that Western prosperity can be attributed to the extent that it has honored property rights, free exchange, and a price system deserves only the intellectual status of that part of our culture that is not diseased. I am not clear what it means to say that Rand's ideal sense is true, in what way our definitions or senses true, and I am inclined to suspect that a cluster of praxeological, moral, and historical claims provides credible support for the left libertarian critique of capitalism and for the diagnosis of much of the economic order that obtains in the contemporary West as diseased. This most emphatically does not amount to a positive assessment of actually existing alternatives.